Welcome everyone to a short webinar here on the GFX 100. We have Lewis and I'm hoping I say his name properly, Ibronix, uh, a Fujifilm professional uh, photographer with us today that are going to share a little bit on the technical side from what I understand of the GFX 100S as well as uh, in the field uh, behind the camera type uh, information. So. I trust this will be an informative time for you. We uh, thank you for joining us here. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Lewis from Fujifilm. Hi everybody, my name is uh, Lewis Navarro. I'm the senior product specialist for Fujifilm. I'm based here in Southern California. Normally I cover the West Coast. And uh, I'd like to go over our camera, GFX 100. So I do have, uh, I'm gonna have a view of the camera looking down compared to our previous uh, back generation of our DSLR back uh, in 2007, uh, we had our uh, Fujix uh, S5, X Pro 5. So, and then after the, that, I'll show uh, PowerPoint, go in some details. And then from the details, I'll present you in, in Barrio next, he will be giving his presentation. He's actually our creator who had the camera, the pre-production camera and did some, uh, some photography, um, I think his is a lot of it's on uh, portraits and street. And so and so after his presentation, um, we were able to answer any questions pertaining to his experience. But if you do have any questions, um, I think the ones I will see maybe on comments, I'll answer those. But most of the questions will be answered to the end. So let me give you a quick shot. So right here I'm showing you is our GFX 100S, and to the left or your right, depends how you're looking at it, this is our S5 Pro that came out back in 2007. This is an APS-C sensor in a medium format. Pretty much identical in size and weight and everything, build size. Um, we really made this camera to be very compact. And this, of course, the GFX 100S does have IBIS and no IBIS on this. So difference in comparison to the two mounts, but I just wanted to show you that. And also a reference to is back in 2007, we did use similar style of a battery that we introduced back in the X-T4, very efficient. Uh, so it did bring it back to more amperage, but I just wanted to show you a quick look on that. So what it does look side to side. And so being so compact, great for travel, great for you know whatever you do, weddings and street, uh, commercial, even in astrophotography. So, Real quick, I'm going to go ahead and start the PowerPoint. Uh, you want to make sure you do see that PowerPoint. Um, and um, so GFX 100S, it is using the same sensor and processor as a backlit sensor. Um, it is the same 102 megapixel sensor as the 100, uh, just in a smaller compact body. So what you get out of it, it is lightweight, size very compact, and of course, the price. The price on this is just $6,000 compared to the GFX 100, 10,000. And that, when we introduced that, introduced that back in a year and a half, that was probably the least expensive for 102 megapixel, very practical to use and the first to use in body stabilization. So we're using the same large format sensor, uh, 102 megapixel sensor with a processor, fourth generation, exceptional low light, dynamic range. And when I say low light, this will autofocus. If you're doing astro, it will autofocus the stars. That's how good is uh, the autofocus system in this system. IBIS, uh, internal body stabilization is uh, six stops. And of course we do have the same quality as our GFX 100 professional video quality. You could do 12 bit ProRes RAW through your Automos 5. Camera, it is definitely very stealth built. It is uh, over 60 places sealed. Uh, it's uh, thicker than one millimeter thickness of magnesium alloy. Um, all the medium format cameras, all four bodies are weather resistant magnesium alloy, well built for it. any type of environment. If you're shooting very cold weather in 14 degrees, high humidity, you're maybe in a dust environment, uh, it, you know, you can take it anywhere and it's meant to really work any condition. Right here, I'm showing you it's a side-by-side -side to our Model 50S, GFX 50S. That's the one we introduced just a little over three years ago. That is 
um, a camera that had more of what we call the hump in the back. That's where your LCD was. So it still takes very similar in design, just a little bit more compact, um, very compact in both in the electronic viewfinder. So instead of having a removable electronic viewfinder, it has a built-in, so it keeps a very low profile. So one thing it does share with the GFX100 on the right side is the control, the display. This display allows you to, to control three different modes. You could go LCD, and if you want, let me show you real quick what I'm talking about. And here you have three different modes. You have your controls of your switches, ISO, and your shutter speed. And then you go into your histogram. One more time, it's your information. Nice thing about this information, under your custom display, you can program whatever is important to you, what metadata or details of your settings. So a very customizable, just like you have on your uh, GFX 100. And then what makes it different from our other cameras on medium format, to the left, we actually have a PSM dial. This allows you to customize up to six customs. You have your program, your shutter aperture, aperture and then your M manual control. Your customs, you could pretty much program everything in there, including your film simulations, your drive, uh, if you want IBIS on or off, anything can be customized in, into C1s through C, uh, C6. Uh, so it makes it very compact. Also, we do share a very similar design on controlling your stills to video. It's a one switch, just like the X-T4. It allows you to go stills to movie. When you do that, if you're in stills, you're only gonna get still options in your menu. And if you go back to your menu and you're under movies, you only have options for movies. Uh, that helps a lot from digging or looking over, skipping each other menus that belong or kind of retain to stills. So make it very simple that way. Electronic viewfinder, the OLED, it is 3.69 million dots. It's uh, 85 frames per second, really good refresh mode. Um, compared to the GFX100, there is a difference. You have 5.76 on the GFX100, but uh, we can have Environnex explain if he sees the difference. Talking to a lot of folks, they don't see the difference. Looking through it, if it does make a difference, they will let you know, but uh, you do have what we call boost mode. You can have boost mode for frames per second, also boost mode for low light ability. That really gives you a higher uh, resolution, so you do have that control by one button. So display, so we're a very similar display as the GFX 100 and also GFX 50S. It uh, does have your tilt and your portrait mode. It does allow it to flex a little bit more on the portrait mode, three-way uh, three tilting. It is 2.36 million dots. It is very bright and very uh, color accurate. So a, if you're shooting in a very bright sunny day, you can really uh, see the details and color matching also uh, resolution. Also, what's new, we added a new uh, autofocus lever. So it has more surface to cover with uh, pressing over with your thumb. Um, it's actually, if you're wearing gloves, say in the winter, it does have a nicer feel control. So something that we had in the previous cameras, joystick, this one actually has more of a surface control. So it does uh, allow you to move your menus and your images throughout each exposure. So to the left of the body is where we have our ports for microphone and headphones. We also have a dual SD UHS-2 slot. So that slot allows you to do is have UHS-2 cards. You can use also, it is backwards compatible to UHS-1. Uh, if you're shooting video, then we probably will recommend to have a V90 card or 285 bits per second. That way allowed information to go straight to the card. Uh, it does have a 64 meg buffer. So the buffer is there for sending the information. And if you have a slower card, but you could use a slower card, especially if you're a landscape photographer and you're taking it pretty slow, taking your exposures. But if you're gonna do uh, five frames per second, that's this camera's capable to do at 14 bit, 16 bit, it will be uh, one frame per second. But electronic, you could bring it up to uh, 16 frames per second. So definitely recommend a higher speed cards on this one. 
if you um, and pretty much I think it's you pretty much will find them anywhere now. Um, very inexpensive compared to other cards. And then also to, to also below that we'll have our UHSC. So it allows you to charge your camera. So it does come with USB-C cable and a charger, so wall unit. But you also can use a PD battery to power the camera if you want to use the USB-C camera through that direction. Um, also for high-speed tethering. So you could do high-speed tethering through USB-C. And then for HDMI, so micro HDMI. Instead of having the PC sync connection outside the body, we actually placed it under behind the door so it keeps it sealed. So that's uh, very helpful if you're doing uh, any type of control using uh, sync. Um, sync could be from Studio Flash, or if you do, uh, some people have used this camera for making archiving uh, artwork or forensics. Sometimes you have a trigger that has to be connected to that port for the flash units. So that is very helpful. And then to the right, uh, next to the SD card, we do have a port for your 2.5 remote release. And it's covered, so when you're not using it, it is sealed from there, but uh, easy access. So what's nice about it, if you happen to have an L bracket, it is on the opposite direction, not interfering with your cable connection. So it is a nice location. Uh, we've done that with our other X-Series cameras too. So new battery. Uh, we introduced this battery about a year ago with our X-T4. That is the NPW235. It is 2200 mil, uh, milliamps. Uh, the pre predecessor of this battery that we have back in 2007, that was actually 1500 milliamps. So we definitely increased some of the technology it's after a few years. Uh, so you will have 460 frames. There is a optional accessory that's a dual charger. Uh, allows you to charge both batteries. You do have a LED indicator. So it will indicate your status of each battery charge. Uh, using the same charger that comes with the battery, you can plug in USB-C. And also, if you do have an external PD battery, you can also use that if you're traveling, makes it very efficient, compact for travel. Here's the little specs of using the BSI CMOS sensor, just like the GFX100, but it's the G mount. It is a quad CPU, quad core, uh, so identical to, again, GFX100. And here's a little bit comparison uh, showing between the different finder. So the finder is different. So this is a fixed finder compared to interchangeable finder on the GFX100. Uh, also the 50S, uh, GFX 50S is also interchangeable to finder. And also we do have um, a tilt adapter that other units will work. We won't work on this one because we decided to go uh, fixed to keep it a very low profile uh, compact. IBIS. Yes, it's actually smaller than our GFX 100, so it's more compact. Um, same format as for movies. Battery, we did go to a different battery, W235. So it will go 460 frames. If you need a longer run, that's what the GFX 100 will give you. The GFX 100 is a dual battery on the grip, so you could go up to 800. So there's a difference between those two cameras besides the electronic viewfinder, it is a dual battery and it has a built-in vertical grip. On uh, the GFX 100S, uh, there is no op optional um, vertical grip, but we do have what we call a sort of Aqua Swiss plate that you can actually attach to the bottom of the plate itself or the bottom of the camera. Um, body size, it is gonna be more smaller and also li lighter. Uh, same software, Capture One, X Acquire, Adobe Photoshop, and Lightroom plugin and Pro. I believe Capture One is on the second beta. It's been working pretty good. I'm sure we'll release it the week of the full production. Um, I think the beta right now is 1.16 and it, uh, we've been testing, it works really well. So a lot of people are asking if S stands for, though with GFX 100, could you could really look at it as being small and steady. Um, the camera really is compact too. Um, the GFX 100 side by side. So if you needed something that's lighter, um, it's gonna actually be more quieter because of the new mechanism, the new IBIS. So I'm gonna show you side by side images. It is 500 grams lighter than the 100, GFX 100, and also 30% uh, smaller. And what contributes to that is two things. By going a little bit lighter, we done is we added a new mechanical box. So it's a new mechan mechanism and also new IBIS. Uh, that is also more compact. Uh, same thing we made the 
compact uh, image stabilization from the H1 to the X-T4. We've done the same thing with the GFX100 to the GFX-S, 100S. So it does allows us to take advantage of both. For most lenses, you will have your six stops. Uh, the only ones maybe you will get it allow maybe a half a stop is um, the 250 f4 and the GFX 100 to 200. Otherwise, all the lenses you'll place on the camera from the primes to the zooms, you will get your six stops. Um, so also, the gyro has been uh, upgraded for this system, so it's going to be really good for stills and also for video. And with video, we do have some additional options that I will cover in the next couple slides. So here, just showing you that is the percentage of how much smaller is this mechanism, the shutter mechanism, and also the IBIS. Uh, there is some um, improvement in uh, release of time lag from 0.09 to 0.07. And for some reason, it looks kind of slowly blurred from display, but it is 0.07. I can confirm that. Uh, improved minus low light PADF is minus 5.5. That's using the new 81.7 lens. The AF tracking has been upgraded. The eye detection has been upgraded. And also face-to-eye face -to detection has been upgraded. So because it's being PADF, face detection does really well, both very low light for eye and face detection. And one thing we added new to this camera that... Um, the other cameras have this cam the other cameras have 18 film simulations now we added additional one uh, so this will make the 19 this actually is called nostalgic negative so anybody's been around printing days back in the 70s and 80s um, when i was printing i started photography back in the 70s i used to uh, shoot color negative had it printed to my local lab and those are the days i used to have uh, round corners that's what's what's in fashion not the cor uh, corners uh, square corners, but the round corners, it just give you really nice cyan skies. And then um, you have some rich shadow color. Um, it's just very synonymic, I'm sorry, synonymic look of uh, uh, the quality of combining both the films and the papers. Uh, back then, uh, DMAX wasn't as rich, so it's kind of had another warm uh, colors on your shadows. Uh, so it's a very nice, color-pleasant uh, film simulation. So for video, so the video, it is, uh, you're capable to do DCI 4K 30p, F-Log, HLG, and HDMI ProRes RAW uh, going out through HDMI to your Atomos. Um, I have tested it. It is working well on the GFX 100S shooting uh, ProRes RAW. Um, definitely size of... Uh, SSD card if you're going to for storage because your files will be larger. But if you plan to stream through Final Cut, that works very seamless. Uh, we have more options uh, to control that process. One thing with um, 4K uh, cinema function is on the Hollywood industry, this is more considered, I guess, your large format. I mean, for this size of the sensor, they look at it more of a large format. Um, Crop, uh, not a crop, but a large format shooting. Uh, so we're talking your Aries and your Reds shooting large format. Uh, very popular in Hollywood when they want sort of that bokeh look, three-dimensional quality. Um, so the 100 GFX 100 has been very popular for that when they need a maybe a B camera or doing a small sh uh, short production, and but they're looking for a large format look. And so basically giving you that good looking quality of a uh, uh, image, especially if you're photographing uh, people in low light. Uh, having other features, what I was mentioned earlier, so you do have a, what we call digital image stabilization. So there's another factor to help stabilization besides in body mechanically, you have digital. So it does give you a 1.1 crop on all modes, but it does a really good job. So if you don't have a gimbal, of course, gimbal will be a little bit next level smoother, it will be smoother than the digital, but the digital will give you a nice move for gimbal uh, stabilization look. Uh, so. Also, you do have what we call uh, boost mode. So boost mode will give you like the third option of stabilization. It was designed for if you're doing interviews and you forgot your tripod or sticks to really maintain that steady look. Um, so that does a very good job. 
Um, but again, it's not designed for for petting, it's just for still shots, especially for interviews. Uh, but it does work really good. Um, film simulations, you will have them all. We also have MP format that allows you to upload a smaller file if you're doing YouTube or anything small that you need to upload. Along the side, you can format also to H.265 codec and H.264. Um, you could back up your uh, movie from uh, slot one to slot two, not just stills. Uh, you do have your F-Log ProRes 12-bit out, and, and you can record up to 120 minutes recording, so you do have a longer time record. And then also you do have a dual display of recording time, so it gives your countdown and your full storage. Uh, last PowerPoint, and just go a recap on the system. So we have a new mode dial controls. We also have a new film simulation, uh, improved and new IBIS and mechanical shutter, and we have our new battery. And again, it's uh, scheduled to release March 11th. It is for $5,999.95. Uh, we are on schedule. It's on for color in black finish only. But uh, if you're interested, definitely put your pre-order uh, with Camera West. Um, so that way you'll be one of the first ones to get the camera. And that I will present you to Barionix, who he was based here in Southern California, who has done our creation for the camera. Uh, it's a lot of the creators who had the camera, we actually didn't have even the video options. So that's how early production, but, uh, but he, uh, Eric Byron next actually had, was fortunate enough to test our camera and make some really awesome images. Thanks, Lewis. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. As, as he was one of the, uh, one of the photographers who had access to the pre-production model of the camera while I was here in the United States. Uh, I, along with uh, I think at least a half a do half a dozen other photographers, um, shared use of the camera. So I basically had it for I think about something around like two weeks, which isn't a whole. It's not a lot of time to get familiar with the, the new camera, but because of my familiarity with the existing X, you know, the X series cameras, uh, it was fairly fairly easy for me to become acclimated with you know the, the controls of the features of the camera so i could get out and immediately use it um i currently work as a special projects photographer for the huntington uh, library gardens and museum uh, here in southern california and we recently acquired uh, the gfx 100 which we use largely for archive purposes so we will uh, use the 102 megapixel sensor to photograph artwork books letters, other materials um, that are part of the collection or part of an exhibit uh, for archiving. And so I had a little bit of uh, use with the camera in that respect, but largely it's been used on a rig. Though I did use it on the campus several times, um, it really wasn't a practical camera for the kind of work that I do, which is largely portraiture and street and travel photography. Um, the the resolution and uh, the capabilities of the camera are amazing, but the GF100 uh, was really reasonable for me in terms of just size and because of price, but that's changed with the uh, GFX100. So I'm gonna share my screen and share some of the images that I made uh, during my period with the camera. Just give me a moment. So hopefully you're seeing the uh, the image on the screen if you can confirm it or let me know otherwise. So, um, so for me, any camera that I use has, really has to be an extension of my eye and hand. Um, because I do a lot of street and travel photography, I'm often reacting to things that sort of play out in, in front of me. So I don't want to have to think about whether the autofocus is performing well, I'm going to have an issue with exposure, um, you know, trying to figure out how I change any particular given setting at all. And thankfully, um, I didn't have any of those issues with, uh, with the camera. So almost immediately, I was able to just go out and just see what this camera could provide me that was different from what I was used to with my Fuji cameras and before that a full frame. Now, one of the things that really impressed me 
was the dynamic range of the camera. Um, because it was pre-production, we didn't have access to um, the ability to convert the raw files. So I couldn't process the raw files. So everything you're seeing here is, is JPEG. And despite the fact that Fuji is well known for the quality of their JPEGs and the color that they deliver, um, I've always just preferred to be in complete control over my images. Uh, but this was, a, you know, a, a fine opportunity for me to just see what the JPEGs could deliver. And one of the things that pressed me immediately when I pulled it up from the computer was the fact that this camera offered incredible dynamic range. That when I looked at the histogram, both on the uh, display on the camera and on the computer, I could see that I had headroom both in the highlights and the shadows. And if I nailed the exposure, uh, which I usually did because I was using the multi-pattern metering on, on the camera, which with all the other Fuji cameras I've, I've ever used has been my default. I rarely use spot or center weighted metering just because I find that the multi-pattern multi, uh, multi metering system is, is so consistent. I was, I was amazed that um, even in really high contrast situations, uh, I always retained important shadow and highlight detail. So this camera has about a stop range and that's fantastic. And when you see the files, especially these, these, these high resolution files, they're impressive. But when you see how much detail you're holding on to your highlights and shadows and that you have the flexibility to massage those later uh, that for me is was very exciting uh, and this is and, and i'm saying this having only really seen the jpegs um, when i finally start working with these files in capture one or uh, or lightroom uh, in the next couple of weeks i just expect that i'll be even more impressed by what this by what this camera delivers. Now, medium format and this size of a camera is not something you would really think is practical for street photography, but uh, I find that the camera, because of its size and its form factor, um, wasn't a distraction. It wasn't, I didn't find that it was burdensome in any way. I was making another shot when this fellow moved through the scene and I only saw him from the corner of my eye. so. All I had time to do was like whip the camera over to the left and fire two frames. And later on, when I looked at the picture, I was completely amazed and surprised that he was absolutely sharp. Um, despite the fact that this is a medium format, is traditionally been seen as not, you know, not having the greatest autofocus. I found that the autofocus was really good. I didn't find that it was... Um, letting me down when I needed it. Um, I wasn't using it for sports, but there's another photographer, Michael, I think Michael, who does uh, a lot of like um, motorsports and uh, mountain climbing, who has used the 100 and used the 100S. And I think that in some of the material that you may find online, his use of the camera, he found it uh, quite adequate for that kind of work. So, so I don't challenge the camera to that degree, but I want to know, that when I point the camera at my subject, whether it's static or moving, that it's going to be able to nail the focus. And uh, I found that it, I found that it did. The, 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 the ergonomics of the camera is really kind of interesting. They have, um, they have buttons and the location of the buttons is always really a big concern because there's certain features I want to be able to customize and control like you know being able to apply exposure compensation or change the metering mode if i want to be able to do that and all those other things and i found that it, it was really convenient that in terms of my hands uh within a very short time i i knew where to go i've used the camera systems where i'm always having to remember okay which button do i press in order to do this or to do that and i find that really distracting um I'm really about trying to make a camera that I really don't even have to look at in order to be able to use effectively. And 
and and this camera gave me that. Even though with the brief time I had it, which was just t- just two weeks, I was really pleased that I didn't spend half a week um, getting comfortable with the camera. Now the resolution of the camera is 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 amazing. I'm I'm usually using an X Pro three or X one hundred F and an XT three. So twenty six megapixels, you know, is is usually what I have to work with, and you know, I've made prints 13 by 19, 20 by 30 uh, from those, and I've been really happy with the results. Working with uh, 102 megapixels, that's that's a whole nother world. And one of the things that I really um, got to appreciate is what the prints look like when you make it from, from, from this camera. And I think that anyone who invests in this camera, you are definitely going to want to make prints from it. Um, if you're not making prints, it's really hard to, to justify spending this much of the camera if all if the images are only going to be relegated to a computer or, um, you know, posting on Instagram. Uh, but I love the fact that I could make 30 by 40 prints, especially close up of faces and portraits, and get this level of detail that was just beautiful to look at. And uh, it was nice because I made prints from anything from eight and a half to 11, all the way to 30 by 40. And it was just like mesmerizing to take a look at what that, that resolution gave me. But one of the things that was more important to me is that I started seeing something different from these images that I, that I had seen be uh, than I had seen before. The thing, one of the things that I noticed was that due to the, the the larger sensor and the optics of the lens, that there was there was this sort of compression that was happening, and that the resulting images exhibited this, this sense of depth to them. And I'm not talking simply about the shallow depth of field, about the bokeh. Uh, a lot of people talk about bokeh, 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 bokeh this preoccupation on it in you know, which is largely as a result of, you know, focal length, camera to subject distance, and aperture. And this camera certainly gives you that. I mean, if you want, you know, the sort of creamy bokeh, the 80 millimeter or the, I think it's the the, the one the 110, uh, which are considered ideal for portrait, will certainly, certainly give you that. But what I found was that this depth and this, this may images almost 3D. Not only my pictures, but some of the pictures that I've seen others others make with this camera has been really, really fascinating to look at. And so I started thinking about what this camera was giving me that was different from what I was used to and how I might sort of leverage it to do something different with my, um, my photography. Uh, I'm getting one that I'll be able to use for a longer term, but I haven't gotten lenses for it yet. So um, I'm looking forward to playing with this more. But there's a certain look that you get from this medium format camera that is really distinctive. And I think it's it's not something that you can attribute s- strictly to specifications. You know, you go, Lewis read off a bunch of details regarding the camera, regarding resolution, you know, frames per second and all these things. But until you actually get to see a photograph from this camera, I don't think you can really fully appreciate what it gives you. And I know there are a lot of people posting images online. So, and if you can, you know, take a look at some of the pictures that are online. And I think some people are posting like full resolution JPEGs or raw files. You might be able to get a sense of that. But I think that if you're considering this camera, you have to really think about it for more than just the possibility that it gives you so much more resolution, you know, that it's 102 megapixels. Uh, There's certainly cameras out there uh, from other manufacturers that give you relatively high resolution from, you know, 45, 50, maybe 60 megapixels. And if you only look at based on resolution, then any camera that you choose, I think you're 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 making an error by just looking at it based on numbers. For me, it's like 
yeah, may, resolution may be a big consideration for me, but there's so many other qualities that are important to me because, you know, a, a lower resolution camera that gives me the functionality, that gives me the performance that I need for the work that I do is more a critical consideration than just the fact that I can pack that, that they can pack that many more megapixels on, onto a sensor. And that's what I, I really enjoyed about uh, the cameras. I felt that it gave me everything with respect to performance in terms of autofocus, metering, dynamic range. But it also gave me something, uh, um, an aesthetic quality that I wasn't used to when I was photographing normally. And one of the things that I liked about the camera that, that is directly related to the resolution was that I considered um, cropping in camera. So for a variety of different scenes, I would use the four third um, proportion. So this gives you, uh, if you're used to the 35 millimeter format, um, this is a little more, uh, more like uh, four, four thirds. Uh, so it's eight by 10 rather than eight and a half by 11 if you're producing a, a print. And that, that proportion was very different from what I'm used to. And at first I thought I wouldn't like it, but I found that that was one of the things that really turned me on to shooting with this camera is that those different proportions really required me to look at scenes and subject matters in a very, very different way. But because of the, the high resolution of the camera, one of the advantages for me was the ability to choose different different um, proportions. So I could go, I could create a panoramic, I could create a, a square. Um, there were so many different proportions, so many different form factors that I could, I could choose. And because of the resolution, I still was able to produce a, a file that was rich in detail and that I could still blow up considerably and not have any issues about, oh, the quality of the images has been degraded because all of a sudden I've like, you know, cropped out half of the image. I'm if I cropped out half the image, I'm still working with 50 megapixels. And that was really, really fun to play with. And I found that as I was photographing, I would see a scene that I just felt like, oh, it just demands that I shoot it in a different proportion. This is this is one such of those images. And uh, this image was, uh, I'm just amazed at this photograph. I was driving um, near downtown Los Angeles and I saw the light hitting uh, this neon Felix sign for a car dealership in, in Los Angeles. And I think this is the first neon sign that was able to uh, um, constructed in, in Los Angeles. And you had this late afternoon light hitting the sign, hitting the palm trees, and I grabbed the camera with one hand, pushed it up against the windshield, and just fired three frames. And the image is tack sharp, well exposed. And to me, that's just absolutely amazing, especially considering the size in the camera, the fact that I was hold, hand holding it, and that it gave me an image that is just as sharp, well exposed, as a picture that I, I I would have created had I been standing on the street holding the camera with two hands and making the, making the photograph. This is the first time I've had a chance to really use a, a camera with um, built-in stabilization. I have not used, you know, the X-H1 or any of the other cameras other than the X-100 that I mentioned. So this is the first time that I'd had a real chance to play with a camera that has stab stabilization. There are lenses that have stabilization, but um, largely I'm a photographer who use fixed focus, uh, fixed focal lengths lenses. I'm not really using a lot of zooms. So there, though there are zooms in the lineup that have image stabilization, you know, I've never really taking advantage of that. And, and this camera, especially uh, in situations when I was playing around with relatively slow shutter speeds, I find that it was spot on. Um, from my early experience with the first 100, I, quick, I really quickly realized that, that because of that larger sensor, I had to be sensitive to the shutter speed that I was using. Uh, I couldn't just act as if I'm using my X-T3 and think that, oh, you know, you're using 
I can shoot it a 15th of a second and still get an acceptably sharp shot. Now, that's, that's sort of borderline. When using a large sensor, that shutter speed is absolutely critical. Um, without the image stabilization, I doubt that I would have been able to get away with a hundredth of a second uh, and still get a sharp photograph. With this, with the image stabilization on, I found that I could effectively, you know, I could push it to about a thirtieth of a second for me. Maybe there are other photographers there that will find that, that they can shoot it at slower shutter speeds than that. But for me, um, there was a lot of comfort in knowing that the camera will allow me to produce really sharp results, even when I'm using it in relatively low light and having to use fairly moderate, uh, moderate shutter speeds. Um, the lenses that I used during my time with the camera, uh, I only had two that were available to me. They were the 32 to 64, which is the zoom, which is the constant F4. And the other one I think was the, I wanna say it's the 40 millimeter. I don't know the aperture. Uh, for it. And um, the great majority of the shots I used with, with the zoom. And uh, you know, with both lenses, I found that uh, the overall resolution, uh, optical quality in terms of sharpness, um, the, um, the level of micro detail was really amazing. Uh, I don't do, I don't do test charts. So you know, I can't really judge it on fall off in the corners and you know, whether there's any sharpness at the extreme edges of the frame. You know, people like DP Review do that, those kinds of evaluations. What I'm really concerned with is, does the image work for me? Does it look good? Is it sharp? Is it giving me color? Um, you know, and once I pull in the image, I'm not looking at it in order to, I'm not looking at the image in terms of writing a review. I'm looking at it in terms of, is this an image that satisfies my creative whether I'm shooting for myself or whether I'm shooting for work or whether I'm shooting for a client. You know, I, I want images that I'm happy with first off, but that, that, you know, whoever I'm shooting for is going to be just as happy with. And um, one of the things I'm very much looking forward to is doing more portraiture. Uh, I photographed my cousin who's a, mem a member of a band called the Young Jesus Band. And, um, I had I had intended to shoot some images for the band before COVID happened, but that, so that didn't pan out. But I asked him to come out, and we made some photographs of him, and uh, the the portraits were just just beautiful. Um, I was able to work in a variety of different lighting situations, both that involved direct sunlight, some that cried open shade, and and the images were just re really nice, skin tone. Uh, the details of like in the hair, the texture of uh, of, of clothes and different things like that, um, I just loved. And uh, again, when I have access to the raw files, I'm really going to be curious to really see what's possible with that camera, um, especially with the way it renders skin, uh, skin detail, color. Uh, JPEGs are wonderful, but it's the raw files that for me really kind of tell you what's what the camera is really delivering. Uh, though I wouldn't hesitate in a pinch to, you know, shoot raw plus JPEG and provide someone uh, a JPEG knowing that I, I could give them really, really good, good results. Um, let me think what else I can say about the camera. Um, in terms of, of, of the resol the resolution of the eyepiece, I, I know that Lewis mentioned that before. For me, it, it wasn't really a concern at all. It looked really, really uh, good for the viewfinder. And I like the articulating screen because it gave me a lot of options in terms of, you know, positioning the camera relative to the scene of the subject that didn't re rely on me having to... Um, you know, look through the eyepiece all the time. There's sometimes when I want to make an unusual shoot from an unusual angle and having that eye angle uh, eyepiece that can I use both in a horizontal or vertical orientation is, is just really nice. You know, I can only get so close to the ground that it becomes really difficult to get back up. And uh, it's just nice to have that versatility rather than just having sort of a fixed, um, a fixed screen on there. Um, as, as, as was said, I didn't have a chance to play much with respect to video, so I really can't answer any questions with respect to, to, to that. I'm not much of a video shooter. I'm pretty much a straight, um, 
a straight still photographer for for the most part. Um, but I, I think that uh, from everything that I've read about the camera and what I've heard other people say about the performance, that if you're looking for something that's sort of a hybrid uh, camera that provides you both, it, if this thing if this thing performs as well as it did for me as a still still camera, I I have find it hard to imagine that it won't deliver just as good an image for you as uh, as a videographer. So that's it for my images here, and um, I'll go back to the screen here, and I'll be glad to. Me and Lewis will be glad to field any questions, whether they're technical or, or about my experience with the camera. I do see somebody had a question. It was, is there a crop panoramic format? So just to define it, because um, I had that question in the past. So there's no panoramic mode. And that means it will take a, sh sh a few images when you're actually moving it left to right. But it does have, like our other GFX, has a format 65 by 24. If anybody's familiar with that format, that is the same format as the Hasselblad X-Pan and also our Fujifilm uh, TX. We made the TX1 and 2. Actually, we actually made the Hasselblad camera and lenses since they were uh, medium format lenses. And just to give you a quick look what the camera does... I'm uh, going to show you through the camera. So here's our native is 4.3. If you hit the Q button, you glide over. So there's the native 4.3. Here is your 3.2. And here's 16 by 9. Usually that'll be your cinema mode video or 79 or 69. And then one to one square. And here is your 65 by 24. Uh, that is, if you go back, you'll see that format. So when you do shoot raw, you get everything. But in the JPEG, you will get that format in a JPEG. Um, the beauty about it, I think when we introduced the 50R with the 30 millimeter 3.5 uh, 3 lens, that was sort of your 24 millimeter lens. And I think that was very popular with X-Pan or TX lens or TX camera that give you a 24 millimeter wide. So yeah, you can attach uh, and get that mode um, in any of our lenses, but I think the most popular lens for a lot of people. Right now I have my 50 millimeter 3.5 and that really gives you a view of a 35 more like a 40. And our 30s gives you a view more of a 24. So that is that on that portion. Um, then there was a question about size of images. So your raw will be 210 meg files. Your JPEGs are close to 75, but if you could create a TIFF from your RAW in the camera, but that will be a 600 meg file. Uh, so it is a very large file. Uh, second is you do have pixel shift, just like the GFX 100, it's already in there, it's ready. So when you get the camera, it's ready. And what that does is you're capturing a 400 megapix megapixel image. So what it does, it takes 16 images of RAW files. We have our uh, Pixel uh, combiner website, uh, our software on the website. You can download it's free or you can use anybody else's software. What it does, it will create all those 16 files into one DNG and that's about a one and a half um, terabyte. Um, so it's a large file. Um, but yeah, it is capable to, to do uh, both tips and if you wanted to or JPEGs from the camera. Let's see, what else? Anybody else? Seems to be a question. See, I, I have more of a printer question. I'm interested in contact print level detail at 8x10 or 11x14. Do you find that current printers can resolve at 30 LP slash MM with GFX? Yeah, lines, per, yeah, lines uh, with Mike GFX millimeter. files. I mean, the camera medium format was really people who print it uh, for commercial, um, detail by detail. Um, like Ibarra Nexi, you know, uses for Hunting Library for detail. So if you're doing artwork, you want the detail of the brush strokes of a painter. I mean, zoomed in to get every bit. 
One thing about shooting 16-bit, because this is a true 16-bit file, it's not interpolated like some other cameras, because uh, this sensor will capture and, and deliver, is 16-bit, you're looking at another, a wider color space. So if you're shooting fall color, you're going outside where some 12-bits or 14-bits, well, especially 12-bits, you're getting trouble getting uh, hues in the yellows and, and the bright oranges because of fall color. And then you got to remember if you print in silver highlight, it doesn't go outside that gamut. It's a smaller color space. Uh, what that delivers in that larger go, uh, color space or that gamut, it will be uh, definitely a 12 color uh, inkjet printer. So that will get you those hues out there. So a combination with the camera, with the inkjet, especially on a uh, bigger color space of 12 colors or 14 colors, that definitely will get you in there. And then plus the detail, the fine detail um, resolution, not just the sharpness, but the detail that you can really move in close. Yeah, one of the ways that we're using uh, the GFX 100 is with the with the software that allows you to get to 400 um, megapixels from the camera is in photographing old, old maps. Because a lot of the researchers want to be able to really zoom in to detail um, to, that you can get on a, on a map. And having that high resolution and having that level of detail uh, is something that wouldn't be possible uh, before. Even when we're using a 100 megapixel camera, uh, having you know four, four times the resolution is really um, not only provides you photographically this high resolution file, but it provides a real practical solution for people who use materials where they need to see that fine level of detail. Looks like we have a, another question here about uh, the GFX 100 providing multiple expo exposures and blending modes in camera. Yes. So just like the X-T4, and see if I can give you my view. Um, I'm going to, let me go back to my standard 4.3. Let's see, 4.3. And so to get that mode, it's in our drive mode. Uh, just hitting the drive mode, that's a button to the left, right below the uh, PSM dial. When you go into that drive mode, First is your still images. Second, when you go down, it's your high speed burst. So you could go all the way to your five frames per second. And you might not think five frames is fast, mechanical, but for when you're shooting 210 meg raw files, it is pretty fast moving that shutter. And then your CL, that's your three frames. Uh, you could bracket your ISO, bracket wide balance, and then you go your bracketing into exposure, ISO, film simulations. Right below that, there's your multiple exposure average. So you have additive, average, light, and dark. So you have four options how you want to bracket, and you get up to nine, uh, nine frames, nine exposures, into, or not nine frames, but nine exposures into one. So in the pre previous generation, it was just really two images. Now you have up to nine, plus some of the control, how you want to do that. Uh, one thing I've done um, back when it was just two frames, uh, every time I was in Palm Springs, I'll put it on my tripod, do double exposures, uh, capture the windmill. One, a very fast shutter speed just to stop the blades. And then my second was a slow motion just to get the blur of those blades. And so, and then, of course, it creates one file. And you get this image with motion, but at the same time with still of those blades. For now, of course, you have nine images. You could do so much more. Great. I think that was our last question. Um, thank you guys for, for doing this with us. Uh, we have a lot of excitement going on here at Camera West about the GFX 100S, and I know we have lots of pre-orders. Um, so a lot of uh, excited customers about this, and, and we can't wait to see it in person, actually. So uh, we will hopefully be s seeing this ship here soon. Um, if you do have any more questions, go ahead and feel free to reach out to us at either one of our locations, or visit us online at camerawest.com or email us directly. We're always here and available to help you out and offer any insight we possibly can. 
So with that, I think we are out of time. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.